Tragedy strikes again. The everlasting realm of the dwarves had fallen following a grueling defense against the Skaven. The rune of Azamar is broken, and the High King lies dead at the hands of the most ruthless Skaven assassin in the world. The dwarf refugees that manage to escape death lock themselves deep in the mountains, while some make a daring break towards imperial territory to the northwest. There is no place on the horizon that is not tarnished with the terrible black smoke of the apocalypse, and there remain few places left in the dying world to make a stand against Archon the Ever Chosen. Terrible drums sound, echoing like the heartbeat of a dying titan as the whole of the demonic forces mobilize. The time for Archon to seize his throne of power is imminent, and his three eyes burn ambitiously towards the city of the White Wolf, Middenheim. Welcome to our latest episode on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy, where we will cover the fall of Middenheim. Sounds like it's time to get out of there, but don't you be caught weighed down by your bulging coin purse, handle your money with style with the sponsor of this video, Exter. They bring you the Exter Wallet, a new innovation in lightweight money moving that carries up to 12 cards with a clip for cash, but takes actually using the cards to the next level by adding a button that pops the cards out of the top for instant access. And if you think that's neat, you can also strap on their tracking card, which is a little solar-powered slice that lets you ping the location of your wallet from your phone anywhere in the world, and the battery lasts for months after just hours of solar charging, losing your wallet just got a whole lot harder. It comes in all kinds of materials like leather, carbon fiber or aluminum, they're super thin and super light, and right now you can get them super cheap in the Black Friday sale, with up to 50% off and a free cash clip when you spend over $90. Go check it all out via the link in the description and use our code Wizards and Warriors to get extra discounts on top of the sale. The three-eyed king has long awaited this moment, the hour of which his destiny is at last unveiled. He leads an army of madness and rage against which no sane being would willingly stand. Perhaps I am not sane, as I will fight one last time, not for victory, but for survival, for the hope that a spark can endure. It is a slender hope, and the laughter of the dark gods rings loud in my ears. These are the end times. Prophecy of the End Times Before Archon could truly bring forth the end of the world, the fortress city of Middenheim had to be taken. This was a daunting task even for the Ever Chosen, as the fortress was built on and around an unyielding mountain that stood tall over Drakvald, one of the five largest forests in Imperial territory and had never fallen to any invader. But the need to seize the city directly from the forces of order was absolutely necessary, for beneath Middenheim rested an artifact left behind by the Old Ones themselves. With it, a ritual could be performed to tear open a portal directly to the Chaos Realm and doom the world forever. Wasting no time, Archon marshaled his countless legions under the banners of Korn and Sinch the enormous march attracting the attention of fearful red eyes in the shadows. News of Archon's next move quickly reached the Council of Thirteen in far-off Skavenblight, sparking a vicious debate between the Lords of Decay. While supremely successful in nearly all of their invasions, the Under Empire was feeling the sting of losses. They chittered and screamed, should the Under Empire attack the Ever Chosen? Should they run Skitter away and heal? The council was paralyzed by panicked indecision and infighting, and just as they were ready to leap over the table and frantically tear each other apart, the greatest of the vermin lords, Screech Vermin King, appeared before the arguing council. He reminded the lords that their pledge to the Great Horned Rat was always to devour the people of the civilized world totally, and that it could still be achieved. Screech advised that if the Under Empire were successful, they would force the Scions of Chaos to accept the Skaven as equals, and perhaps even their masters. The Council, unable to resist the temptation of ruling over not only the world but the Apocalypse itself, agreed to send an envoy to the Three-Eyed King. Screech Vermin King summoned a Rat Ogre bodyguard for Thankwall to accompany him on their trek north. Afraid of offending Archon with any military presence, they did not bring any military regiment to protect them. The three emerged to the surface near the greatly accelerated march of Archon's vanguard, 
and made the uneasy walk towards the heart of the army. Demons and warriors surrounded them as they dared to approach the Ever Chosen, and many times Than Kuol thought to abandon the envoy and hide away. But eventually, the three rats found the encampment of Archon and his elite, and bent the knee to the Ever Chosen. Astride Dorgar, Archon considered the offer brought from the Council. The Under Empire would serve chaos in the final days. Beside Archon perched Kairos Fateweaver, acting as Archon's eyes into both the past and future. Like all Skaven, Thanquol spoke much but said very little. All the while, Kairos interrupted to ask a bizarre range of questions to discern unknowable details. After deliberation, Archon accepted the Under Empire's pledge and Thanquol gleefully returned to the Council. With this news, he assured himself, he was destined to claim an unoccupied seat on the council. He prostrated himself as the saviour of the entire Skaven race and set to work plotting terrible schemes. Oblivious to the deal struck between Chaos and the Under Empire, Emperor Karl Franz struggled to maintain morale. Telepime, the great crater fortress of the Empire, had been lost. Altdorf was suffering the final days before its fall, and nearly every village and hamlet was being ransacked by beastmen, demons, and plague. During the final hours of the Glotkin siege on Altdorf, Volten, chosen of Sigmar, and Magister Patriarch of the Amber Order, Gregor Mataf, arrived from the east after the failed effort to maintain Gelt's Golden Bastion. They witnessed the freed wind of magic bound to the Emperor as the incarnation of Sigmar himself, and kneeled in total devotion, awaiting orders. A massive Skaven army emerged from the earth and encircled dying Altdorf, forcing Karl Franz into an impossible decision. He entrusted Valten to play the role of distraction in the north, while he dedicated his resources to securing a swift exit south and towards one of the few remaining Imperial strongholds in Averheim. The Emperor demanded that Valten and Martaf make an effort to survive and rendezvous in a town north of Kemperbad moments before the diversion was launched. Though encircling an easy target, the living sea of ratmen squabbled and fought amongst themselves. Capitalizing on the Skaven's disorganization, Valten and Martak rode out of the northern gatehouse and launched a surprise skirmish. Hysteria broke out among the Skaven ranks, providing the perfect opportunity for the Emperor, the last of the Bretonian Knights, the Reichsguard, and the Knights Griffin to escape with as many civilians as they could manage through the South Gate and towards Kemperbad. The diversion was successful, but Valten quickly realized that he and his men were stranded deep in hostile territory with neither food nor shelter, and the wilds crawled with raiding beastmen. However, Martak, as a powerful amber wizard, knew the wilds well and summoned one of his many woodland familiars. A black raven whispered news that the nearby fortress city of Middenheim still stood defiant whilst besieged by Skaven. Inspired by the legendary resilience of the city, they changed course to the city of the White Wolf, gathering surviving garrisons and militia along their way. Swelling to numbers of a proper army, Voltan and Martak again surprised the Skaven surrounding Middenheim and animated the Elector Count's men into a coordinated defense. Voltan's arrival also served as a surprise charge into the Skaven rearguard. The rats scattered and cleared a path into the underbelly of the Skaven army, but as Voltan managed to carve a path halfway through the pack of rats, the Skaven rattling guns and poisoned wind mortars turned their attention onto the Imperials and opened fire, caring not if they annihilated their own regiments in the process. The bombardment caused Volten mass casualties. It seemed that this was where he and his men were going to die, until a horn sounded from the southern gatehouse of Middenheim. The drawbridge slammed open as Elector Count Boris Todbringer and the Knights of the White Wolf made a ferocious charge into the Skaven front lines. Boris was successful in carving the rest of the way towards the safety of the city. Once he and Volten rendezvoused, they turned around and forced their way back into the city. Again it seemed that Volten and Martak had found themselves stuck in a city under siege, but they found that Middenheim was in much less dire straits. Inside the city, the unexpected reinforcements found food and rest, while Volten and Martak joined Todbringer in the Great Temple of Ulrich for an urgent war council. 
the elector count declared that the arrival of Volten was fortuitous and provided a justified opportunity to deploy a sudden strike against his old adversary, Beast Lord Kazrak the One Eye. Without allowing a chance for discourse, the elector count designated Volten as acting Lord of Middenheim in his absence and organized his troops for another charge out of the gate. Again, Todbringer and the Wolf Knights barreled through the weakened Skaven front line, weaving through the siege camps with ferocious speed as they made for the last portions of the Drakvald that had not yet been cut down to fuel the Under Empire's war machines. Diving headlong into the bowels of the darkened forest, they encountered an alarming number of beastmen, much more than they anticipated. Where they thought an easy ambush had presented itself, they instead realized that they had marched to their deaths. Packs of Ungor and Minotaur scrambled into skirmishing maneuvers and slaughtered both the knights and infantry. Knowing there were few options, Todbringer unsheathed his rune fang and pushed even further into the beastmen herd alone. Indeed, he found the one-eyed beast lord who eagerly uncoiled his scourge whip to face Todbringer in single combat again. The beast men brayed and snorted as they duelled, stirring into an enraged frenzy as Boris attained an advantage and stabbed the rune fang deep into Kazrak's remaining good eye. The herd dogpiled onto Boris and ripped him to shreds, decorating the forest with his viscera as the drums of the apocalypse drew nearer. The three-eyed king has come. With the empire in flames, Archon Ever Chosen has marched south with all the armies of ruin at his heels to claim his birthright and usher in the Age of Chaos. The city of Middenheim, one of the few bastions remaining to men, dwarves and elves, is his target, for buried deep within the mighty rock upon which it sits is an ancient weapon with which he will bring about his ultimate victory. Prophecy of the End Times the very same day that the Elector Count marched himself to his terrible fate, Archon's enormous army arrived at Middenheim from the northeast. Like vermin fleeing the rising flood of a sinking ship, the Skaven siege dissolved before the presence of the Ever Chosen. Black clouds and crackling lightning blotted the sky above the advancing frontrunners of the Chaos Army. Chariots, hulking Chaos Knights, Chaos Hounds, and even Dragon Ogres were peppered along the regiments of Northmen and Chaos Warriors. Volten scrambled to fortify the Great Temple of Ulrich, the words of Boris himself fresh on his mind. As long as the fire of the Great Temple lasts, Middenheim and Middenland will never fall. Boris Todbringer, Elector Count and Grand Duke of Middenland and Middenheim. Archon awaited to give the attack order, confronting his supposed Skaven allies over their miserable attempt to siege the city and weaken it prior to his arrival. Cowering before the Three-Eyed King, they pledged a renewed assault by his command. The Skaven Warlord and the Ever Chosen devised a cunning plan. The Viaduct Gatehouses were a critical capture point if they had any hope of breaching Middenheim's defences, and Skaven were infamous for the art of infiltration. Volten, wise to the tactics of the Ratmen, assigned Martak to oversee the defense of the Middenheim tunnels, while he commanded the men on the walls and in the streets. Kairos whispered a harrowing detail about the unfolding truth of Middenheim's fall, for there was a thief right under the nose of Volten that would destroy the very hope they clung to. Appearing as a thief in the night, Teklis infiltrated the city and snuck into the temple. He stole the very flame that brought the defending men hope, planning to use it to revive his brother, Tyrion, who was killed during the disastrous collapse of the Vortex. As quickly as Teclis came, he vanished, and the city left behind was thrown into a cacophony of panic. Wasting no time, Archon gave the order to begin the assault while Middenheim was in disarray. In the tunnels of the mountain, the very first wave of invaders crawled and gnawed up into the defending companies of seasoned infantry. Pack after pack of Skaven slaves and clan rats died, but gave the real Skaven fighting force a perfect opportunity to enact their carefully planned scheme. Clan Eshin gutter runners invaded the gatehouses unseen and planted concealed devices at the base of each building. Retreating a safe distance back, the devices were triggered. Of course, the Skaven weapons were as faulty as they were cruel, and both the southern and western devices malfunctioned. 
The devices in the north and east gatehouse worked perfectly, however, and spewed a noxious gas that rose and filled the towers completely, damning the defending garrisons to a horrid death as they drowned in the pus that filled their lungs. The gutter runners doubled back, fixed with gas masks to infiltrate the gatehouses again. They cut the throats of any stragglers and opened the drawbridges. The horns of Archon's army sounded and they poured into the gatehouses like a black tide. Above, Kairos's flight of flamer demons took to the sky, awaiting the perfect moment to douse the city in demonic flame. Volten's defenders and Archon's front line crashed together in a bloody fight for control over the north and east portions of the city. Volten managed to hold off the first wave until the arrival of the Dark Omen Malagor. The winged beastmen, feared and hated by men, soared into battle from Archon's army and weaved a spell over Volten's defenders. The men fell to the ground, their bodies contorting hideously until they were unrecognizable beasts. This forced Volten to fall back, the streets quickly being overrun with demons, beastmen and chaos warriors. Volten accompanied the Knights of the White Wolf in their gallops around the inside of the city that the Imperials still controlled, invigorating the defenders with courage and resilience. For a few hours, the Knights and Volten were able to ensure a second chance at fending off the invaders that had breached the gatehouses. That hope quickly faded as Martak and the forces originally intended to guard the mountain tunnels emerged from their underground posts overrun by the unlimited numbers of Skaven bodies flooding the mountain. The Skaven army beneath the city gave chase to Martak and his survivors. Right before a devastating flank from the Skaven collided with Volten's men, Martak's eyes shone with icy white light as the wolf god Ulrich hosted himself in the powerful Amber Wizard. With the rage of winter itself, a massive blizzard was conjured around Martak that killed hundreds of Skaven in the blink of an eye. Seeing a break in the horde, Volten and Martak rushed through the opening to retreat to the Temple of Ulrich for their last stand, placing faith in the strength of Sigmar and Ulrich to destroy Archon in this siege. The mortars and the Hellstorm rocket batteries rained death down into the streets as they were emptied and replaced with uncountable Chaos Warriors. Countering the offense, Malagor took flight and summoned a murder of crows to peck out the eyes of the artillery teams. Extending a beastly claw towards the Knights of the White Wolf, he summoned a portal beneath them and the road devoured the regiment entirely. However, in this overextension, Martak managed to catch the Dark Omen distracted and impaled him with a magic amber spear. The Dark Omen was dead and a cheer of rejuvenated morale erupted from the city. Ominously, the streets continued to empty, the Chaos Warriors parting way for the terrifying Swords of Chaos, the personal servants of the Everchosen himself. Through Martak, the Wolf God's magic summoned another Ice Storm Blast towards Archon and his elite, but they emerged unscathed. The last remaining Wolf Knights and ferocious and barbaric Fell Wolf Brotherhood contested the march of the Swords of Chaos and held them off for a time. Kairos foresaw certain victory and flew his horrors over the mountain to the western portion of Middenheim. At the same time, Martak sensed a disturbance in the winds of magic and broke from the northeastern streets to pursue the flying demons of Sinch, dedicating the wolf god's winter magic to douse out any arcane flames that Kairos could summon. As the defense of Middenheim began to fall apart in the Pandemonium, the Temple of Ulrich suffered a tunneling ambush by the bulk of the Skaven army under Warlord Skraslik. Volten was forced to duel the Warlord just as Martak was forced to duel Kairos. Kairos, infuriated by Martak's meddling with the certain future, was bested by the winter magic and was forced to retreat. The northeast, however, succumbed to a damning setback as Archon isolated the Grand Master of the Wolf Knights, Axel Weisberg. Despite his speed, the Ever Chosen pulled him from his horse and tore his torso in half, painting his onlooking men with viscera. With this kill, Archon effectively gutted the morale of the Northeastern Front and advanced towards the Temple of Ulrich. Vardak fared much better than Axel, quickly gaining the upper hand against the Skaven Warlord and killing him. The rats temporarily fled back into the tunnels, but the Ever Chosen continued his ascent to the temple. Charging towards each other in an encounter that will seal the fate of the very world, 
the Slayer of Kings and Galmaraz crashed together with a thunderous boom. None had hoped to even be able to touch Archon, but in their duel, Voltan and the magical Warhammer landed a decisive blow to the Everchosen's armor and dented it heavily. However, the upper hand was soon lost, as Voltan's head was suddenly lopped off his shoulders by a cowardly vermin lord, invoking the wrath of the Ever Chosen. Martak rushed to reinforce Voltan and was dismayed to discover his death. The Amber Wizard committed a massive burst of ice onto the Vermin Lord and Archon, but the Ever Chosen again emerged unharmed from the magic. Closing the gap, Archon swiped his sword across Martak and cleaved him in two, securing victory for Chaos. So soon the hour of fate comes around. The Ever Chosen stirs from his dark throne and prepares the blow that shall split the world asunder. Realms of old have fallen, lost beneath the fury of the Northlands, or smothered by vermin from below. Some heroes battle on, too stubborn to realize all hope is lost. Their time is past, and a new age of chaos and dismay beckons. Perhaps I am foolish also, for I fight with no hope of victory. I seek only to weaken the Dark Gods, to shake their hold upon the future. No other course remains, not to mortals nor the Divine. Lilith, Goddess of Prophecy Middenheim was lost, and the artifact of the Old Ones needed to plunge the world into eternal darkness was firmly in the grasp of Archon. Survivors fled to Averheim with news of the city's fall, but Karl Franz forbade them from speaking more of it to avoid panic amongst their men. Still committed to fighting to the last breath among friends, Ungrim's slayers and the Grail Knights remained at the side of the Imperials even as Archon pushed his invasion and besieged Averheim. Humanity, even with no hope for victory or survival, made a stand against the most feared warlords of Khorne to rival the glory of even Sigmar's conquests. Even after being whittled down by constant hell cannons, the Knights of Humanity and Bretonia charged out into the streets and bled the army of Khorn as much as they could before meeting their own demise. Balthazar Gelt, having absorbed the Wind of Metal since High King Thorgrim's assassination, summoned a legion of Golden Dwarf statues to do battle beside the Slayers and Ungrim, who were surrounded by a maelstrom of fire. The factions of Order fought until they were forced to evacuate the city, leaving the dwarves behind to die the glorious death they sought. As the Emperor and Bretonians fled for Athel Loren to meet with the remaining incarnates, Averheim and the entire Chaos Force sent to take it were obliterated in a hail of fire, the fate of Ungrim unknown. In Athel Loren, the incarnates gathered to weigh their limited choices. However, discourse broke out among them as Nagash approached the council, hoping to strike a deal between the forces of order and the undead in the wake of his failed ascension to godhood. More videos on the end times are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.